On December 2nd, 1859, at 11.15 in the morning, John Brown would be publicly murdered, and at 11.50 a.m., he would be pronounced dead. It would be the greatest day of his life. John Brown was born in Torrington, Connecticut, on May 9th of the year 1800. Through his life, he would become a prominent abolition figure, distinguished most by his radical, outspoken beliefs and his advocating of militancy and taking violent action to kill the infamous tyranny that was the institution of American slavery. He was a man who believed strongly in taking action and was in fact reported to have stormed out of an abolitionist convention in New England, held in 1859, saying, Talk, talk, talk. That will never set the slave free. What is needed is action. Action. Brown's legacy as a folk hero and a martyr for the abolitionist cause was forged through a series of events that would ensure him a place in history. He would first fully emerge into the foreground of the abolition scene through what would be known as the notorious Potawatomi Massacre. This was truly the beginning of Brown's career as a militant activist. Brown had received word from his sons, living in Kansas during the period dubbed Bleeding Kansas, that pro-slavery settlers there were terrorizing anti-slavery settlers through violence and bloodshed. The news at this time was filled with articles about violence being used by pro-slavery advocates, whether it was one of the many incidents coming out of the vast prairies and plains of Kansas or the caning of Senator Sumner. Each of these events were receiving support and commendation from pro-slavery newspapers, and through these, John Brown reasoned that violence was clearly not below these proponents of slavery and thus came to the only logical conclusion. With these thoughts in mind, he left for Kansas to protect his sons and their families. While marching to the defense of the town of Lawrence, John Brown and his men received word that the town had been sacked by pro-slavery settlers, led by one Sheriff Jones, who gutted the Free State Hotel with fire. Two days later, on the evening of the 24th of May, 1856, John Brown, four of his sons, and another man would retaliate, bringing about a night of terrible vengeance which would claim the lives of five violent pro-slavery settlers. The peace and silence shattered as Brown and his sons dragged the men from their homes into the night and forced them to account for their crimes. After receiving these confessions, Brown watched as his sons stained the night sky crimson with heavy strokes of their broadswords. By the dawn of the 25th, Brown and his sons would be gone. Brown and his sons would participate in several other incidents and skirmishes in the conflict and canvas before leaving shortly after Governor John W. Greary ordered both sides to disarm and disband and granted clemency to the former fighters. However, none stand out as vividly as the night of terror that, that was the Potomac Massacre, as it sent a very strong and forceful message. The message is the same one that the Montresor family motto from Poe's Casca Montiato sends. No one harms me with impunity. Brown would not be thrown fully back into the limelight until he made his highly controversial raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry. He spent the gap of time between these two defining moments in his life gathering funds and troops in preparation for this raid with the assistance of a group of wealthy and influential abolitionist figures known as the Secret Six, who included the notable Garrett Smith, who was a link in the Underground Railroad. The actual raid itself would begin on the night of October 16th in the year 1859. It is widely accepted that Brown's primary goal in capturing the army was to use the weapons there to arm a violent slave uprising, although he denied such allegations. This casts some doubt upon such a conclusion, as Brown readily admitted to many other many of the charges leveled against him, so it's unclear why he would deny this, but not much else. The raid suffered from a lack of troops, as the number of men Brown had anticipated showing up to join him was vastly greater than the actual turnout he received. Nonetheless, he decided to follow through with his plans and enact the raid. Whether this was through sheer optimism, or if his goals had changed, and if he had indeed planned on in martyring himself prior to the failure of his raid, is unclear. Despite resistance from the townspeople, Brown and his men captured the armory that night. They were discovered the following morning, and after militia cut off the bridge he was intending to leave by, he took a group of prisoners and fortified his position in a small engine house. They were soon surrounded by a mob of townspeople, many of whom were drunk. Brown at one point sent out his son and another man carrying a white flag, but the townspeople shot them. Another of his men was shot trying to swim away across the river, and his drunken killer shot up his dead body. The president sent Robert E. Lee, then a brevet colonel, with a detachment of marines to combat Brown and curb the excesses of the drunken townspeople. After a brief battle, the Marines broke through the defenses and wounded John Brown and captured him and his surviving men. His time in a Virginia prison after the raid would serve to cement his status as a hero and martyr for the abolitionist cause. He was fully aware of what he was doing and being condemned to death. 
He repeatedly made it very clear that he did not wish to walk free or be rescued, saying, I am worth inconceivably more to hang than for any other purpose. In addition to this, he became very fond of his jailer throughout his time in prison, and even had dinner with his family on occasion. He would have considered it impolite to escape, and said that he would not leave if the door was left open. He vehemently refused an insanity plea, fully aware that a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity would completely undermine the ideas he and his men had fought and died for. Brown's reasoning and logic behind his action was well-founded and extremely understandable. The people of his time were extremely religious, and Brown was no exception. The teaching of do unto others as you would have them do unto you was thrown on quite a bit, usually to dissuade violence. John Brown, however, took a very different interpretation of this saying. He reasoned that since pro-slavery people of the South were already treating abolitionists with violence and using cruelty and brutality against their slaves, he had better be the reciprocal of the saying. Since they were treating others like this, it seemed only reasonable to treat them the same. His usage of the Bible to support his actions would have naturally held a lot of weight with his supporters. In his last speech, delivered to the courtroom after his conviction and sentencing, he said, This court acknowledges, as I suppose, the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which is supposed to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament, that teaches me that all things whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I should do even so to them. It teaches me, further, to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavor to act up to that instruction. I say, I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted I have done, in behalf of his despised poor, was not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice, and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit, so let it be done. John Brown's execution would signify the last nail being driven into the coffin of the compromises between the pro-slavery South and the anti-slavery North, in a sense heralding the death of slavery itself. Brown knew that through his death, he could become something more than a man and effect even greater change than he could ever do in his life. When visited in prison by a Miss Spring, he told her, I think I cannot better serve the cause I love so much than to die for it, and in my death I may do more than in my life. John Brown was a man capable of such profound empathy that he became one with the slaves, and their pain became his pain, their suffering his suffering. Many people have trouble justifying his actions even though they support his goals. But the simple truth is that if John Brown had been a black man and not a white man, his actions would be viewed in an extremely different manner. The radical abolitionists at the time raised the question, why should that make the difference? Essentially, why should the color of his skin be what defines his actions? In Brown's eyes, this was self-defense, and he recognized that the problem of slavery could no longer be solved through peaceful means and that emancipation was needed now. He saw that the country needed an end to slavery immediately, and felt just as he told his executioners when asked if he was ready, just don't keep me waiting.